everybody, welcome back to the channel HTM here. And in this video, we'll be diving deep into Oblivion portals coming soon to the Blackwood chapter for the Elder Scrolls Online. What are they? Where do you find them? And what is the difficulty level? In particular, I wanted to know how easily they could be soloed, especially if you just had average gear. In this video, we'll be answering all those questions and much more. So get ready, we're diving into Oblivion portals for the Blackwood chapter. Let's start off this guide by talking about how and where to find Oblivion portals. Uh, these are going to show up throughout the new Blackwood zone, similar to dolmens in the base game zones, but much more sporadic, much more difficult to find in this case. The best strategy I have found is to usually travel across the main roads. There's two roads that run from the south end to the north end of the zone, and then there is another third road that stretches from west to east. Now, most of the Oblivion portals that I have come across, and I've gone through many of them, uh, most of those are visible from the main roads. Now, I will occasionally veer off the road, and that's to just get a better look at my surroundings. So if you see a hill or something in the Blackwood Zone, something where you can get higher up, to get a longer view of what's around you, I will usually go up, take a 360-degree view of my surroundings just to check that there's no portals in the area, and then continue moving along that road. Now, the reason why you need to do this is because the way that portals spawn into the zone is so much more subtle than what we're used to with, you know, the base game Dolmens, where you have the huge laser beam in the sky and the crashing and all the sounds. Oblivion portals are the exact opposite of this. And that's what actually makes them much more challenging to find. There's a very faint audio cue, like a humming or a buzzing sound. You really won't hear them first. Uh, what you will do is you will see just a very tiny red glow in the sky, a little pillar of red light and that's how you know an Oblivion portal has spawned. It's definitely a challenge, and uh, thematically, I mean, it makes sense because, remember, these are not the full-blown Oblivion gates from the Elder Scrolls IV. These are miniature portals, miniature holes in the fabric of Tamriel, if you want to think about it like that. They're actually very secretive events, and so for that reason, they don't draw a lot of attention. So once you enter a portal, you'll see that you're actually placed into the Deadlands, which is technically a public dungeon. There are many different paths through the Deadlands. There's many different islands that you'll be uh, jumping in between on different portals. And the island where you start seems to be random. Also, keep in mind that other players can join in this public dungeon as well if they go through the portal also. But there will be times where maybe it's only you in the zone. And so that's where we want to talk about the difficulty next. Now, on these outer islands where you start, the difficulty is actually very easy. Uh, I would compare these enemies to, like, Dolmen enemies, pretty much. You have different types of basic Daedra enemies that you'll need to get through. You know, Scamps, Daedroths, uh, the Flame Atronox, nothing too crazy to start with on these initial outer islands. No bosses either, so this is a nice introduction to the Plane of the Deadlands. Uh, there's some really good sites from the outer islands as well, I definitely recommend uh, once you kill all the enemies, don't rush in. Just uh, take a second to look around because it's quite impressive. Taking the next portal from the Outer Islands, that's going to bring you to the set of Middle Islands, which there are six of these, which you can be randomly placed on, and they're all fairly similar. Now, this island is different, though, because there will be a boss and there will be some more uh, challenging enemy types, specifically casters that have AoE damage shields. Watch out for these guys. Make sure you put them down quick, because uh, if you don't, they're going to be basically shielding all of your damage to the other nearby enemies. You also have the Slaughter Priest now, which is a fairly uh, beefy, high HP enemy. So those are the two things you want to look out for uh, when you're starting the next set of islands. Now, the first boss you have here has about a half a million hit points, and there's different bosses depending on the island that you're on, which I mentioned earlier. This first boss, not a big deal. I think this is pretty easy, like, overland story content boss mode. Pretty easy to solo for most builds. If you have any problems at all, remember that companions are coming in the Blackwood chapter. Something like a companion healer build, uh, if your build is not totally up to par, could actually help you out quite a bit in this instance. After that first boss, we're going to have more waves of Daedra. Remember again to watch out for those casters, keep your heals up, and you should be good to go. As always, there is no time limit, you guys, to the Oblivion portal, so take some time 
especially when you first find one to wander around. You're going to find some really cool stuff in the background, uh, which you can see right here. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to find. There's actually multiple giant NPCs. Uh, sometimes they fight each other, they interact with each other. So make sure you take a minute to check out what's around you. This next portal is going to take us to the inner set of islands, of which there are three of these. You're going to need to fight through more waves of Daedroth on these particular islands and more enemies at a time, more waves of enemies. So I think the most I've had at once is maybe like eight, eight or nine enemies coming at you at once, especially if you have a lot of casters on the island can be pretty challenging. So as always, things like damage shields, passive healing skills or uh, sets that heal you when you do damage, things like these are going to really help your overall survival when you get to the later islands uh, in the Deadlands. Also, if you have any ultimates with crowd control, I might save those for this third island. This The first wave that you get here can be a little bit overwhelming. Now, I'm skipping some enemies over on the right side, but what you can do if you want is you can use those to build up ultimate, and that way you'll have another ultimate ready for the next pull, which is another rather large pull of about eight to nine enemies, similar to the first pull on the island. That should definitely help if you don't have like a, a lot of champion points or you don't have maxed level gear. And that's going to bring us to the second boss, which is this giant titan. Uh, and this is where I actually died a couple times, and my companion died uh, the first time we went through a portal. Uh, the thing with this boss is you get stunned quite a bit, and you can get knocked back as well. So there's multiple crowd control effects like you saw right there. With the addition of some pretty powerful AoE flame damage, the, the fire breath that the Ash Titan does. There's also a several invulnerable phases. What you'll need to do when the boss is invulnerable is kill the adds. Depending on which island you're on, the adds look different, but that's basically the mechanic. So the boss goes invulnerable, kill the adds as quick as possible, and then you'll be able to damage the boss again. So this fight could definitely be challenging for, you know, lower level players if you're not prepared for it. Again, what I would recommend is passive healing, healing over time, and then if you have a companion at this point for the Blackwood chapter, think about giving them a couple of extra heals uh, companions actually have really strong heal over time abilities, so if you have that running, uh, shouldn't be a problem for you. Havocrill's Tower is our next area in the Deadlands, and this is where all the islands meet. This Any pathway that you're on is going to bring you to the central location, and there is actually a boss here as well, but I missed this the first couple times that I ran the zone. What you'll need to do to summon this boss is come to each of these statues in the main hallway, stand next to it for... Uh, just a second until it lights on fire. And this is your cue, uh, basically, that the statue is turned on. So at that point, you're going to run over to any one of the other four statues, do the same thing to light that statue, go to the third and the fourth statue, and if you can do all four of them quick enough, uh, then this is going to summon the third hidden boss, uh, which there is an achievement that has to do with this boss as well, by the way. And you will have to face off against all four fire behemoths at the same time first. Uh, but honestly, they, these are just melee enemies. So I don't find this to be as challenging as some of the other islands where you had eight to 10 enemies at once with uh, casters mixed into everything. This should be fairly simple. But again, once the four behemoths are down, the boss should be summoned into the tower uh, and then you can deal with him. This is just the larger model of the, the Ruin Act that we've seen earlier in the Deadland Zone. He does have a few special attacks. The main one to watch out for is going to be the Spinning Blade attack, which can knock you and your companion down. Just a brief stun, really, but the, the damage is, is fine. This is more similar to the first boss, I would say, where probably most people will be able to solo this hidden boss without too much difficulty. And after you do that, you can head out of the tower. Uh, watch out for the bugs on the floor and then head to the main final area of the Deadlands, which is called the Valley of the Cataclyst. Now to start with, this section is very similar to those last inner islands uh, that we had before the tower, where you have, you know, eight to 10 enemies at once. If you're able to get this far, then I don't think you have any problem soloing your way through this final area. The first pull is definitely the easiest, with the second and third pull being a little bit harder. I would reserve an ultimate maybe for the second or third. The second pull you can get either CC'd or negated, so watch out for that. You have some much bigger enemies in the second and third waves as well. You have the Daedroths, you'll have some of the newer enemies, the Ruinox. These have a lot more hit points, so they can take longer to get down. 
but luckily they don't do too much more damage, so I think you should be okay here. In the third wave, you'll see more negates, more of those heavy hitting enemies, as well as a Titan to finish things off. Though there's less enemies here, so honestly, it's a little bit easier than the second wave was. You want to prioritize any casters here, especially if you see one of these tormentors with the spinning, flaming staff in the air. You want to interrupt that because it can do some pretty significant damage to you. But that brings us to the final room where we finally get to face off against the Duke of Storms. Uh, if you've been listening to the audio, he kind of talks to you all the way through the zone, taunting you along the way. And this is where things get really interesting. I like how they did this a lot, actually. It's almost like a miniature dolmen event inside of the Deadlands. So how this works is you will see the Duke of Storms in the middle, sort of forming and taking shape. You do not get to fight against him quite yet. What happens is you'll get three to four waves of increasing difficulty and more enemies. Basically, any enemy that we've already seen in the zone is gonna come back. It's easy at first with the smaller enemies, but then once you get to the final wave, you have multiple uh, titans and behemoths. So you definitely wanna pay attention once you get to this stage of the fight because there'll be a lot of AoEs on the ground, uh, a lot of knockbacks and flame damage, especially from the titan. So just watch out for that and try to kill off these ads as quickly as possible. And once you do that, the Duke of Storms, the final boss for the Deadlands, does does take shape on the battlefield and fights you briefly one-on-one. -on -one. Now, he has several special attacks, a couple of those being heavy attacks or, or channeled attacks, which you can either block or interrupt in most cases. He also has a gap closer. If you get too far away from him, he will charge into you. And he also has a leap attack where he jumps into the air. Uh, it does have an AoE effect on the ground, though, which is fairly easy to see and avoid. So once you do enough damage to him in this phase, about 15 to 20 percent, he'll come back to the center in this sort of magma shell appearance, uh, and he'll be invulnerable at this point. And this is where you need to be careful, because if you get too close to his magma shell, I don't know what to call it, whatever it is, you will die extremely quickly, like within two to three hits. Unfortunately, this happens to my companion several times during the fight, so she's not going to be super helpful in this case. Um, I really should have spec'd her as a healer or a range build. I had her set up as a tank for this fight, and so she was just trying to tank the boss, and so she took the AoE flame damage uh, to the face, and so she went down pretty quickly, so just keep that in mind. Uh, but while he is invulnerable, he'll summon more of those enemies. You'll need to take them down as quickly as possible to avoid the AoE damage, and then as you would expect, once the adds are taken out of the fight, he'll go back to where you can actually damage him again. But that is really it in terms of his mechanics. He'll go through that same routine, maybe three to four more times, summoning more adds each wave, each time he becomes invulnerable. So once you understand the routine, and especially once you realize you need to stay away from his AoE, I think this fight is very possible to solo on many builds. So we've talked about all the encounters in the Deadlands, in the Oblivion portals for the Blackwood chapter, giving you some tips on how to face off against these, especially if you are solo or with a companion. And that really leaves us with one final question, and that is, are Oblivion portals worth your time? Now, I would have to say that depends on what you are trying to get out of it. If you are trying to farm sets for the Blackwood zone, and especially jewelry pieces, then yes, Oblivion portals are going to be your go-to way of doing that. That's because each mini boss is going to give you one piece of a zone set, and then the final boss, which we're watching right now, is going to give you a jewelry piece similar uh, to a dolmen, like where you have the treasure chest at the end. So if your goal is to complete these new Blackwood sets, the Overland sets for the zone, particularly jewelry pieces, then I think you are going to want to find these portals and complete as many as possible. That being said, these sets are also tradable. So yes, you'll still be able to buy them from guild traders if you don't want to spend your time looking for Oblivion portals, which can be a little bit time consuming. The jewelry itself actually might sell for a pretty good price. So if you're looking to make gold in the Blackwood chapter, uh, this might be something you want to look into as well. Now, I also really like the aesthetic, the, the overall look of the Deadlands and how the portals work. So even though I'm on the PTS right now, I don't need these sets. I'm just having fun hunting them down and finding as many as I can. What I'm finding is that the Blackwood Zone is really all about exploration and there's tons of things to do, Oblivion portals being just one of them and it's just one piece of the overall story, which is the Blackwood chapter. 
Regardless of how many times you do these portals, uh, I think you will enjoy them. And of course, there is some benefit as well, whether it's selling the pieces or using them to equip your own characters. But with that said, we'll go ahead and wrap up this guide for Oblivion Portals coming to the Blackwood chapter. Thank you all again for watching. If you made it this far, I hope you found it helpful. And if you did, don't forget to crush that like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Will you be hunting down Oblivion Portals in the Blackwood chapter once it releases? Let us know why or why not. Once again, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you're doing well. Stay safe out there. And I will see you around in the next video.